I remember once I stated online that the Emperor is actually my favorite character in all of science fiction because of how much speculation you could do and how much interpretation there is. But someone replied with, well, that doesn't make any sense. He just seems like your average the ends justify the means boring character. And they actually ratioed me. We know nothing about their language, their history, or what they look like. But we can assume this. They stand for everything we don't stand for. Also, they told me you guys look like dorks. They look like dorks! Oh, I'm gonna... Oh, boy. Now, if you want to talk about putting the Emperor on trial, there's probably a few things you could go for. He's a little bit complicated. But I want to zero in on his overarching ideas and his motivation for launching the Great Crusade, as well as how it was conducted itself. This is basically going to be him on trial for the Great Crusade. You know, people will understandably point to things like the Edict of Obliteration, or Monarchia, or the Thunder Warriors. That's its own thing. Maybe I'll get to those in another video. Maybe one for the Word Bearers, or one about Constantin Valdor. But, I just want to zero in on the Great Crusade. But before we begin, I just want to give huge shoutouts to The Gaming Storyteller and Warhammer Wiki for their help in making this banger thumbnail. I appreciate you guys so much. And if you guys like this video and want to see more characters put on trial, I have Constantin Valdor actually planned, please consider subscribing and liking this video. It really, really helps me out, especially since I'm going to show the subscriber count of this channel to future employers when I'm looking for jobs in journalism or media. But without further ado, let's get into it. And let's start before it even began. Now, we can't really tell when the planning for the Great Crusade itself began, because we don't know how fluid the Emperor's planning has been. We know from Malkador that he's been planning his great work for about 30,000 years, basically since the very beginning. But we don't know how much of that has included the Imperium or the Great Crusade, because it all really starts back during the Neolithic, when the Emperor realized, while watching people paint their hunting plans on caves, that humanity needed unified singular leadership. And funny thing about the Emperor, he's not one to ever change his mind on anything, really. Like, Erda comments on this, Custodians comment on it, Olanius Pearson definitely comments on it. The Emperor never changes his mind about fucking anything. Now, when you watch a video on my channel, there's a bit of an understanding that you have a solid foundation for your knowledge of certain things like the Emperor or the setting in general. Because I'm going to sort of gloss over a lot of things like the Unification Wars or the Fall of Man. It's unknown whether or not the Emperor foresaw the necessity of the Imperium, or if he foresaw the fall of humanity's first empire, or that sort of thing. My personal theory is that the Emperor didn't know these things would happen, but had a general idea of what he wanted the future of humanity to be, and was willing to lie in wait and take things as they come, sort of pouncing on opportunities whenever those opportunities arose. And what were his ultimate desires for humanity? Well, he wanted humanity to be the preeminent, if not only sentient race in the galaxy, as well as the ultimate defeat of chaos, as opposed to just sitting by and letting chaos eventually consume all life in the universe by severing humanity from the warp, something he believed to be the Eldar's ultimate goal, but that they ultimately failed at. He wanted to utilize the entire webway, basically conquering it and annexing it, as a way to sever humanity's connection to the warp because he foresaw humanity growing into a psychic race that would eventually eclipse the Eldar, something that is currently happening and that Eldrad Ulthran believes will be the death of humanity and the galaxy itself. It's been occurring ever since the opening of the Great Rift. This is known as the Psychic Awakening and has seen powerful Alpha Plus psychers springing up all over the galaxy, throwing things into chaos. The Emperor foresaw this tens of thousands of years before it actually happened. Now, does this mean he foresaw the opening of the Great Rift? I don't think so. I think the Great Rift just sort of accelerated what was already happening. The Emperor sought to curate this process so that it wouldn't happen wantonly. This is something he shows to Sanguinius in The End and the Death, Volume 1. So that's it. He wanted to spare humanity the fate of the Eldar as they grew into a psychic race, defeat Chaos, and ensure humanity's safety as the preeminent race in the galaxy. Sounds great, right? And yeah, that's pretty understandable, honestly. But when you look at his methods, things start to get a little muddy, especially if you want to consider if he was actually right. First and foremost, 
Let's talk about the creation of the human-led webway. It wasn't fully creating sections of the webway like some people seem to think. In fact, he was getting the Mechanicum to combine human technology with that of the webway by melding it psychically and through a lot of research so that humanity could one day subsume it and be able to navigate it properly. But would that really have worked? Vulcan has commented on two separate occasions, first on his way to Terra through the webway and on his way back in the webway to confront Magnus, wherein he has looked upon the fusion of human technology and the webway and stated it was never going to work. He said this over and over again, and Vulcan is probably the single best artisan and master of artifice out of all the Primarchs, except for maybe Perturabo. So maybe the Emperor was gonna research it more and was gonna do it better at some point, maybe it was just all a prototype, but if Vulcan continually says it was never going to work, part of me believes that. Maybe it wasn't gonna work, maybe the plan would have to be adapted or redouble. But I think one thing we can all agree on is that it wasn't a sure thing by any means. And if you're gambling the fate of the entire species and the entire galaxy on that, you probably should have some better assurance. That's one thing about the Emperor. Everything feels rushed. The Astartes project was rushed. The Thunder Warriors were rushed. The Webway project was rushed. The Great Crusade was all rushed. Even the creation of the Primarchs was, according to the geneticist that made them, rushed because the Emperor wanted everything done now, now, now. This is something everyone who knew him commented on. Amr Astarte, his lead geneticist. Arkin Land, his lead techno-archaeologist. All these people all agree the Emperor was absolutely rushing. And part of that is because he knew a large conflagration with chaos, either the heresy itself or some other backlash, was going to occur. He was gambling everything on this, and that's part of the problem. The massive risks he was taking, and just how much of the galaxy and how much of fate what he was holding in his one singular hand. However, I will say something to his credit, at least he was willing to try. In my video speculating on the potential return of the Interrex to the setting, I state the reason they sucked is because they knew chaos existed, they knew about the gods, they knew about damnation, however, were not prepared to do anything about it. They basically stated with their hands up, well, chaos will one day consume all of creation, but it's up to us to, I guess, just resist for as long as we can. The Eldar feel the same way. I would rather follow someone who will take the million to one chance at victory rather than simply losing more slowly. And I've stated this before, it's not just the simple heat death of the universe here, we're talking about the painful damnation and victory of evil, chaos is evil, over everything. You can't really sit idle by and let that happen. So even though the Emperor's plan was flawed and possibly would have straight up not worked, I can at least respect the willingness to try. That's something I've stated before and I stand by that. There's also the fact that totalitarianism was a very big part of the Emperor's plan. Now I want to get this out of the way. Totalitarianism in the Imperium and in fiction is different than in real life. In real life, we know it's bad. We know how destructive it is. We've seen it time and time again. Dictatorship and autocracy do not work in real life. But in fiction, it's different and should be weighed as such. That's why it's okay to like the Imperium. Because the threats the Imperium faces are very different from anything that would ever be faced in real life. As such, the political systems will be different. However, despite the Emperor's efforts to put in things like the High Lords of Terra, he alone was unilaterally deciding the fate of the entire galaxy. Can you really entrust that to one person, regardless of how old or how much insight that person has? He was arguably the single smartest living individual in the entire galaxy, and if anyone would be able to direct galactic affairs and hold it in their palm, it would be him. The Cabal even stated that if there was ever any one human they would consider letting into their inner circle, it would be him. But just because he's the best candidate, does that mean there should be one at all? And the truth is, for that one, I simply don't have an answer. I really can't give it to you either way, and I think you guys are gonna have to really form your opinions. I'd love to hear what you guys think about that in the comments. Do you think the galaxy would have been better off with a singular ruler like the Emperor? Or do you believe more openness and flexibility would have been the way to go for a prosperous galaxy? 
just considering all the threats that were there and all the threats that were to come, that's definitely a discussion to be had. And we can even look into some real world politics, yeah I'm sorry I'm violating my own rule here, with regard to the Emperor. The first person that comes to mind is a philosopher known as Carl Schmitt, who you might know as Hitler's premier legal theorist. <laughs> Um, I actually ended up taking a full course on his work in university by complete accident, and I found it to be really interesting. Obviously, you know, he was a bad guy, but his stuff did shine a really good light on the nature of authoritarianism. There's one thing he brought up called the state of exception. Namely, he stated, the true sovereign of a nation is he who decides the state of exception. That being a state of emergency, or when normally democratic institutions can be overthrown, or even abolished. Like, you can have things like city councils, or premiers, or other laws, or the rule of law, but whoever decides when those things go away, or need to be put aside, is the true sovereign. And I think we can say, from Schmidt's point of view, the emperor was absolutely sovereign. Now you can take away from that what you will. Does that mean the emperor knew when to really take matters into own hands, or does that mean his ideology was dangerously close to fascism. I want to hear what you guys have to think. Now you have to remember, just because his ideology could be considered fascistic, doesn't necessarily make him literally Hitler or a demon incarnate. It's because the threats the Imperium was facing are patently different from anything that the real world would face. One of the biggest hallmarks of authoritarianism in real life is lies. They will manufacture fake enemies and fake ideas in order to justify their hold on power, but those threats and problems are very real for the Imperium. There are entire alien races that genuinely would not blink at destroying humanity or enslaving all of humanity, like the Drukhari and the Orcs and the Hrud and many others. And there's a lot of internal problems that could very well doom the Imperium, and if the Imperium fell, so too might humanity. That's a really good segue into the last point in putting the Emperor on trial. The xenophobia question, because the Emperor was a hardline xenophobe. Now, one little fun tidbit I want to get out of the way now is to recognize the fact that the Imperium in the 41st millennium is a far more soft place than it was under the Emperor 10,000 years earlier with regard to aliens. You see, in the modern setting, the idea that all alien races must be wiped out and only humanity should be allowed to exist as the only sentient race is actually now a fringe ideology called monodominance, which exists within the Inquisition, where certain Inquisitors, usually very young ones, will have this very fiery gung-ho way of thinking where they want to purge all the Xenos and commit exterminatus and destroy, destroy, kill everyone who looks at us funny. And that's seen as an embarrassing hallmark of a young, inexperienced Inquisitor. Older Inquisitors who show this idea have to do so privately. There are such things as, quote, closet monodominance, as said in the Eisenhorn books, where Inquisitors will keep these ideas of theirs under wraps because it's seen as embarrassing. Namely, it's seen as weak. Like, you think humanity is so weak that the only way it can exist is by destroying all other sentient life in the galaxy? How paranoid and twitchy are you? That's cowardly. Humanity can rise above any challenge it meets. That's the general consensus among the Imperium, that aliens should be allowed to exist as long as they recognize the Imperium's supremacy. It's not basically the genocidal way of thinking, it's basically a minimum tolerance way of thinking. Hence why the Craftworld Eldar still exist in this time, because if the Imperium really committed to wiping them out, they could. And the Imperium actually has some decent relations with the Tau after Damocles, meaning they do tolerate alien life to an extent. Which is ironic because the Emperor did not. Monodominance is an ideology to be embarrassed about in the Inquisition, but the Emperor absolutely was a monodominant. <laughs> but one must reasonably ask why? Where does this gap come from and why did the Emperor think the way he thought? Well, you have to understand the different environments that existed with regards to alien races in both the 41st millennium and the 30th one. Because the 41st millennium is one where humanity is used to being the uncontested master of the galaxy. They're used to being on top and effectively intoppelable aside from the non-Xeno threat of chaos, internal instability, and orcs that one time that we all just kind of collectively ignore for good reason. However, back in the 31st millennium, and more importantly, the preceding Age of Strife that saw humanity's first empire shattered like glass when the warp storms effectively made all faster than light travel impossible, leading to the pretty understandable destruction of galactic society. 
This left, I would say like 80% of human domains completely vulnerable, especially since humanity was just recovering from the catastrophic cybernetic revolt, a conflict that we know from firsthand sources to be dwarfing the Horus heresy in its destruction, magnitude, and sheer incomprehensibility. Humans are far and away one of the weakest species in the galaxy, their only real strengths being their virality, you know, how much of them they can reproduce, it's said to be humans are like a weed race in canon, and their ability to work together in a cohesive way. Unlike the orcs, for example, or other species which sort of just remain divided and don't unite around a core objective. You see, humanity's only real strength was in its numbers, especially since AI and most of their resources were now gone. So without that, humanity absolutely became the galaxy's punching bag in those intervening years. So many human planets, and I mean so many, had to deal with constant alien piracy, or were under alien overlords. Really brutal ones, mind you. It's even stated that the Eldar had taken control of a lot of human planets. Exodites, Drukhari, even Craftworlders had done so. And even if you could say, oh, why didn't the Emperor just leave those planets alone? You have to understand, being under the suzerainty of a race that views themselves as more civilized and more intelligent and all around better than you, as a brown man, I can tell you, is actually pretty unpleasant. Humanity's domain ended up, for lack of a better word, thoroughly colonized in not the sense of we're gonna take this territory and now live here, in we're gonna take this territory and rule over the people there whether we want to or not. Those exceptions, like the Diasporex, were very much the exception, not the rule. Most of the time, it was other alien races taking control of human space, and that's why the Great Crusade's main function was to fight against aliens. It's why so many humans, as stated in Sanguinius's Primarch book, went along with it. They got this sense of revenge and satisfaction through quote-unquote justice against the aliens. It's closer to what you might consider revanchism, which is the mentality that was mainly perpetrated in France after the Franco-Prussian War of revenge, or taking back your people and your land from an outsider. That's what it really was. Orcs controlled large swaths of human space and had a very large slave economy dependent on captured humans. That is a thing. Drukhari, let's not even get into that. Even Exodites and Craftworlders, the Rangdan, who had an entire interstellar empire, a huge one, where the humans under their control started fleeing to Imperial lines en masse when the Imperium came, and they were ruthless in their lording over of humans. Weirdly enough, the Great Crusade, despite what it might seem like, was effectively the largest slave uprising in galactic history. However, that's not entirely true for every alien race. In fact, a lot of them didn't really have anything to do with humanity. There were ones who just were so unlucky as to be in the way of the oncoming Great Crusade and just got crushed under the boot of the Imperium. This happens quite a bit. Some would beg for mercy before the Imperials but were still wiped out. Yes, humanity was far and away the single most oppressed and beaten down race in the galaxy, but how far does that go we need to ask ourselves. You have to remember, People went along with the destruction and genocide of so many alien races because it gave them a sense of revenge for what the species had endured over the past several thousand years. But just because something feels right, does that really make it correct? The Emperor wanted a galaxy where humanity could never be challenged again. That is why he wanted Xenos races all wiped out if they ever showed any kind of sentience. He wanted humanity to be safe and secure and it's understandable why he and others would feel that that could only happen if everyone else was gone. But you just can't gloss over the fact that this was, without a doubt, one of the single biggest catastrophes in galactic history for anything that wasn't human. All of a sudden, this force came storming across the galaxy, wiping out species left, right, and center, sending a lot of them into hiding, and destroying so much that they are still bitter about it 10,000 years later. I've brought up this species I think twice now, but it bears repeating. The Talarian dog soldiers are an alien race that has a strong warrior culture and have an 
everlasting, intense hatred of humanity and the Imperium because some of their planets were virus bombed during the Great Crusade. And people often like to joke that the reason aliens are so vicious in the 41st millennium is because all the nice ones were wiped out during the Great Crusade. It does kind of seem to be like that if you think about it. If you really read through the Horus Heresy, that holds a little bit of weight if I'm being honest. Now, I want to clarify, your stance on this does not indicate actual real-life political leanings or your personal morals. You could say, yeah, fuck those Xenos, kill them all, wipe them out, destroy them, but that doesn't actually make you an advocate for genocide. Because you, you gotta understand, it's just fiction. It is just fiction. Like, there is a statement from Argel Tal, a really beloved word bearer, who says, when they were fighting humans, man, Genocide is supposed to be such a glorious undertaking, and so honorable. But now that we're fighting other humans, it just kind of feels sour. Like, <laughs> that's a joke, you know, for the reader. Like, it's a tongue-in-cheek joke. Man, they took all the fun out of genocide. It's just not the same, man. Like, it's not indicative of your real-world politics. And there's one theory I also want to float. And it's that the Emperor's main goal was the ultimate defeat of Chaos. And a fair few amount of Xeno species were enthralled to Chaos, such as the Laren, or some of the other ones, like the ones that had the Necrotuk in the Eisenhorn series. It does come up now and again. So, it would stand to reason why, if the Emperor wants Chaos destroyed and seeks to sever humanity's connection to the Warp to starve the Chaos Gods, he would also want to get rid of those races he can't control, the ones he cannot lord over, or strip the warp connection from, as to truly starve the Chaos Gods. That's a pretty brutal way of thinking, however, it wouldn't be solely exclusive to him, because the Cabal thought very much the same thing about humanity. Humans were the second most abundant species in the galaxy next to orcs, yet the Cabal was still prepared to see all of them go extinct in a very short period of time in order to starve the Chaos Gods. So would it be that wrong for the Emperor to switch that logic the other way around? Now, before I end this off, I also want to touch on those human civilizations who didn't want to join the Imperium, but were forced in, or were crushed and completely wiped out. Now, one thing that should be noted is, in canon, it is stated that the vast majority of human worlds found did join the Imperium peacefully. It was a largely peaceful affair, oddly enough, when it came to human planets. Or they would only offer, quote, resistance to the degree that honor demanded. Now, why not leave some civilizations be, though, if that's what they wanted? The problem with that is, it goes back to that revanchist French mentality that I mentioned earlier. You see, if after France had defeated Germany in World War I and retaken Alsace-Lorraine, but a few settlements like east of Strasbourg said, actually, we want to remain part of Germany, we feel like we have more in common with them, or better yet, we're just going to be microstates like Andorra or Liechtenstein. Do you think France would have said, yeah, sure, go ahead, have fun? No, they would have taken them back by force, as much force as needed to pacify the region, even if you can argue that it's not right for them to do so because of the precedent of free independent microstates, like Andorra or Liechtenstein. But there's also the caveat of, these independent civilizations would be more susceptible to chaos without the imperial truth, well, in theory at least, and therefore could be the pry bar to get chaos back in because of how insidious, patient, and sneaky chaos is when they come to infiltrate a civilization. A good example being the planet of Nerth which wanted nothing to do with the Imperium and didn't even view them as human. They viewed themselves as the only true humans. And the problem is, they were fully enthralled to the powers of Chaos. There's also the issue of the planet 2319, such as the one with the Whisperhead Mountains. You know, the one from False Gods? The thing with that is, they just seemed like a normal civilization on the surface and they just wanted to be left alone. But when you started digging deeper, it turns out they were worshipping demons and the ruinous powers and sorcery. Specifically, the demon, Samus, who would go on to become a huge pain in the ass and is literally being mentioned in the End and the Death Volume 1. Is that really a risk worth taking? Now, I think it's pretty clear at this point that I do have a stance. I am more in favor of the Emperor and a big fan of, I guess, his at least desire to see Chaos defeated and his willingness to do something in the face of what everyone else views as inevitable. And I know I end every episode off by saying this, but I mean it now more than ever. What do you guys think? Do you believe the Emperor 
actually was right in his desire to secure a future for the most vulnerable race in the galaxy, and his plan to defeat Chaos, and to claim the Webway, and to take revenge on the Xenos? Or do you believe he was a genocidal lunatic? Do you believe he had the right idea, but the wrong methods, and was way too totalitarian? Do you think maybe he didn't go far enough? Maybe there are some people who think that. I would absolutely love to hear what you guys think in the comments below, but until then, I will see you in the next video.